Philippians chapter number 4, as we continue looking at our truth from God's Word on how we're supposed to think. All right, our minds can go all wonky on us, can't they? All right, they go wonky uh, because it rains out there. And then go wonky because uh, a car breaks down. It goes wonky, but for whatever reason, but our minds can go wonky. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, bring us back to a place of stability, a place of comfort, and a place that God would have us to be. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, Think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for this time that we have. Thank you for this wonderful church. But thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. For his death, burial, resurrection. Lord, for the gift of salvation you've given to me and offered to everyone. Lord, I pray during this next few minutes and moments that you would help me to communicate the truth from your word clearly, succinctly. Lord, I pray that your spirit would touch us. Lord, mold us to be like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we'll give you the honor and glory in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We've looked at a number of words from this passage, kind of broken it down, kind of unwrapped it, unpacked it throughout the last few weeks. We've looked at what sort of things are true and and, uh, what sort of things are honest and uh, what sort of things are just and and pure and lovely. And tonight, the word is, or two words in in our Bible, good report. The words that I'm going to look at is how God wants us to think thoughts that are reputable thoughts. Words that are good report. There's this statement that you make when buying some things and it goes like this and maybe you can help me finish it. It begins like this, buy cheap... What does the end part say? Anybody know? Buy cheap, buy twice. Buy cheap, buy twice. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. I've heard it, I've experienced it. The idea is that if you buy something inexpensive, something that was poorly constructed, it'll probably break on you, all right? If it's not from a reputable manufacturer. I've experienced this with tools before. I found some great deals on tools and before you know it, you're using this screwdriver and the head maybe strips off using this drill and the battery pack dies, using these pliers and they break completely, all right? And so you, you find out pretty quickly you buy cheap and you do buy, twi- you do buy twice. Yeah. Now, when, I'm, you, when I was first married with Doreen, of course, being newlyweds, we had nothing to our name except for debt. And so that was a wonderful time of our life. And I mean, our, I remember eating lunch on a Sunday afternoon and our, our table, you know, was, there was a box, cardboard box covered with a, with, with a blanket. It was a wonderful time of life. All right, because that was a day that Doreen stole my uh, my food that day. Okay, different story, different message. We won't talk about that, but it's in my it's in my mind. And uh, so I'm not bitter though; I'm better. Uh, so, uh, but you, you learned that back then when we didn't have nothing to, to scrape together, God still took care of us. You're wonderful. No complaints here, right? But but you couldn't spend maybe what you could spend later on. I, I remember during that time I had to buy a pair of running shoes. It was before I went to buy good pairs of running shoes. Someone had given me a gift card to Nike. And I thought, well, this is great. Nike, they make lots of shoes every day of the week. Went down there with my, my gift card. I bought a pair of Nikes and I put them on. I went running that day and I had not gone but a quarter of a mile. And my four-mile run that day was around the track at Birch Run High, or Bridgeport High School when my knee began to cramp up, my knee began to hurt, and then the tendons began to hurt. I finished that four-mile run and that day went to the runner store on now on Bay Road and bought a, a very expensive pair of running shoes and instantly the pain was gone. I learned that day that I bought cheap. I didn't buy a reputable pair of what I needed for running and I had to buy twice. I remember in college I bought a pair of Johnston and Murphy dress shoes. Very expensive for a college student. I was you know, working my way through college and paying a lot of my college bill. and Man, they were expensive pair of shoes for me. $170 or so at that time. Saved up, scrimped and saved, and went to the department store. It was Belks. Pastor Lett went to Belks down there in Greenville and, and bought them right, not, not, a, not a refurbished yet, not a discount set, bought them right off the shelf. They were a single monk pair of shoes. Austin's here somewhere. All right, man, they were nice. And I wore those things for about nine years. I had them when I came here as youth pastor. I had them resold. They were a good pair of shoes. They were from a reputable manufacturer, and they were worth the time and investment that I put into them. 
The Bible is going to teach us something, I think, from this passage about having thoughts that are reputable, that are worth thinking about from a good manufacturer. I would say tonight, I'll kind of lead off with this, that often our thoughts, if we're not careful, are useless thoughts. Not unnecessary, but useless. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I imagine a lot of us have spent a lot of time thinking about COVID-19. I have. Now, I've limited my intake of news, but I have. And, and, and to be quite honest, if I can be quite transparent, I'm not, I'm not diminishing the, the pandemic around us, all right? There are people that are saying, I'm not diminishing that. But in the light of eternity, what does it really matter? In the light of eternity. You say, well, well Pastor, I've been thinking about my car. And, and they're necessary sometimes. But if we're not careful, our thoughts aren't of good report. They're useless. They're not reputable. And, and so tonight, I want to focus on this, this word there, and these two words in our Bible, about, about thoughts that are reputable. I'll give us two thoughts about this. The first thing I would challenge us to do is I want us to think of thoughts when it says good report, of thoughts that are commendable thoughts. Now explain that. Or things, think on things that are well spoken of, commendable thoughts. Or can I say it this way? Commendable versus critical. Commendable versus critical. Now, it is easy to be critical. In fact, I am probably a veritable expert at criticism. My whole life I've been good at this. I can see the negative in a situation. And I bet I'm not alone in that. I have to work not to be critical. You say, Pastor, I don't have to work. You're right, you're not working at it. Someone said this, for every action, there's an equal and opposite criticism. (laughs) Someone else said this, it is much easier to be critical than to be correct. Now, I'm not as much talking about what we say, but the Bible says this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you find yourself uttering things that are critical, then the Bible tells us, the Bible tells you, and the Bible tells me that what is inside of you are critical thoughts, not commendable thoughts. In the Bible here, Paul says here to Philippians, I want you to think on things that are of a good report, that are reputable, that are commendable. We live in a day and age that makes it easy to be critical. In fact, people who are critical online almost get a bigger platform. There's almost nothing to be said to those who support something, but if you have a critical idea or a criticism of that idea, of that thought, then all of a sudden you can be front headline page news. We've seen during this time where people who are in a different field say sports. Now we're supposed to care what they think about disease. Now, I'm happy to know that these people can play wonderful sports. They're going to be far better than I ever will be. But why do I care if you can throw a football or dunk a basketball what you say about COVID-19? I don't. Why do I care what you say? Because you can run faster than I can any day of the week and run records. Why do I care what you think about how the government's handling COVID-19? But yet to be critical, boy, you're headlined. You're news. They call them online, sometimes they call them trolls. There's a lot of trolls out there who are not just online, they live among us. And if I'm going to be honest and transparent, they live inside me. It's easy to be critical. Oh, what I was talking to some of the night, what do we say though? Chance of rain tonight, 30% chance, right? What do we say? Oh, it's going to rain. Easy to be critical, easy to be, instead of commendable. We live in this day and age and you can't do that, you shouldn't have done that. Are your thoughts commendable, or really are your thoughts just expendable? All right, critical thoughts are expendable thoughts. Commendable thoughts are ones we can hold on to. They're reputable of good reputation. Someone said this, it's a fact, that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. They usually dislike themselves, and they want to criticize so everyone else feels as badly as they do about life in general. I've experienced this. I've said before, I can't wait. I can't wait until I'm really old. Then I can say what I want to say. Now, if you're really old, you fall into the really old category, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to put a number on that. 
and you want to say what you want to say, then more power to you. But usually those things are not helpful. Right? There's a certain idea about that. But, but what's inside comes out. And that's why I believe it's so important to have thoughts that are of good report. Someone said this, I thought this was humorous, too bad that the only people who know how to run this country are busy driving taxi cabs and cutting hair. So true. We're all self-proclaimed experts in our field that we're not involved in. I'm a doctor. I'm a nurse. I'm not a hunter. I know that right, right now. But boy, we can become critical. How do you bury a good idea? Say things like this. It'll never work. We've never done it that way before. We're doing fine without it. We can't afford it. We're not ready for it. It's not our responsibility. That's how you bury a good idea. I want to challenge us tonight and challenge, hopefully the Holy Spirit will challenge you. Are your thoughts that you have, are they commendable thoughts? Or are they critical thoughts? Well, I don't know why he got a new pulpit. Now, I'm not picking on the new pulpit, all right? You're, I'm not preaching this because someone's picking on me. Uh, you, you must know that a lot of those things just wash off my back, you know, and I'm sure someone's not going to like this beautiful pulpit, all right? And Brother Merchant, you did a tremendous job. Your son, Danny, did a phenomenal job. And, it, and if you don't like that, then I'll, brother, brother Dan, I will fight for you. You did a great job on this pulpit. It's beautiful. But someone's not going to like it, all right? That's the way life is, right? It's just the nature of the beast. I, years ago, I saw this principle as a youth pastor. I've mentioned this illustration before, but I'm giving out free pancakes, pancake breakfast. Walk in a different classroom, this classroom, another classroom. Walked into, I believe, it was a ninth grade classroom. Free pancakes tomorrow. No classes in the morning. Teachers making them. I'm excited. Mrs. Wilson was with us at that time. That's how long ago it was. And she was bringing uh, chocolate chips to make smiley faces. You remember that, Mrs. Dalton? She brought chocolate chips to make smiley faces. And one student pipes up, what? No sausage? Huh. But that's how. It's much money. That's not fair. Critical thoughts versus commendable thoughts. The Bible wants us to have thoughts that please the Lord, and we do that by making sure that our mind pleases God and have thoughts that it's easy to be critical. It's easy to tear things down. I want to have thoughts that are commendable. Amen. Warren Wearsby, great author, Christian author, wrote about a great British preacher by the name of Joseph Parker. He had just finished preaching a tremendous message at the city temple in London, as the, the account goes. And after one of the services, one of his listeners came up and said to Dr. Parker, you made a grammatical error in your sermon. Now, I've made plenty of them, and many of you have been so gracious to point them out to me, and I don't mind that. All right? I can laugh at myself. I'm an idiot. I, I'm okay. As I laugh at you, I can laugh at me. All right? So I don't mind, I don't mind that. I did not. That's not why I brought this illustration. Okay? You can laugh at me. If I do something dumb, we can laugh it up. All right? My kids know that. I'll laugh at them. They can laugh at me. But, but someone came up and said, Dr. Parker, you made a grammatical error in your sermon. He then proceeded to point out the error. And Dr. Parker looked at the man and said, And what else did you get out of the message? Hmm. That hurts to put on for me sometimes, right? I, I, I've been there. This is as much for me as for anybody else tonight, okay? If we're not careful, if I'm not careful, all right, not for, forget you. If I'm not careful, I look at criticism. And I say, well, I would have done that differently. And my way would have been perfect. There would have been no errors with my way. My way would have been 100% accurate. Now we'll never know. We didn't try my way, but, but I would have known that. I mentioned about that, the wood, you know, in front of the pulpit over here, right? That was my idea. Complete and utter failure. The dark stain. I was hoping it would work. You know, but hey, you know, no one bats a thousand. I don't even bat one sometimes. Think of things that are commendable. The second word I want us to give, maybe paint this in a little different nuance, is think on things of good report, commendable and profitable. It's commendable and then there's things that are profitable. See, it's not just the fact, and this is a biblical principle, it's not just the fact that we're not thinking of the negative. There is the putting off and putting on principle in the Bible. 
all right, where we put off the old man and put on the new man. All right, it's not just I don't want to. It's like how am I supposed to think? All right, and then the passage of things that are of a good report, it, it finishes with this. Think on these things. So I'm supposed to put something on. So I put off that which is not commendable, critical, and I put on things that are proffering. Too far behind the times. Tiresome tunes, meaningless words. His father put an end to his son's complaints. And he said, if you think you can write better hymns, then why don't you do just that? So the boy went to his room. And apparently that day wrote his first hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross. Boy's name? Isaac Watts. The year 1690. He wrote over 350 hymns. You may know another one. He wrote a little familiar tune called Joy to the World. Hmm. His father had a good, a good challenge for him, didn't he? Had a good thought for him, didn't he? You can dwell on the negative and what, and, but, or you can, you can think about the positive, the profit, profitability, so do something about it. This side of the word, I believe, helps us understand that not only should our mind not be geared over here, it should be geared to things that'll be profitable to the ministry, to the family, to yourself, to the Lord. How can we increase the kingdom of God? How can we help the church to grow? Paul in 1 Timothy says this, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. I told you I got ahead of myself earlier, but on this things, on the, under this thought of being profitable, there's some of our thoughts that are like that vain jangling speech, which is, means empty speech. It means worthless, vanity, no use, useless thoughts. Useless thoughts often fill our mind. Most things on this earth are useless thoughts. What am I having for supper? But you know what? Thinking about supper can occupy a lot of my mind. Thinking about lunch can. I'll tell you when it can. When I used to sit, when Pastor Lett was preaching, Sunday morning, 11.30, 11.35, he's preaching along, and all of a sudden my mind goes to lunch. i got to bring my mind back to the sermon. Am I, am I the only one who's ever guilty like that? No, it happens. I can think of more useless things when I should be doing something else. Can't you? Useless thoughts. I'd say this, most problems that we face in life are truly useless problems. Not all of them, but most of them are. Yesterday, I had to replace a sump pump in my basement. Now, I'd say that's not useless. I don't want water in my basement, but let's be honest. This house that I own, which is a beautiful house that God gifted our, our family with, we are so thankful for. It is a vacation spot for us, a home away from home, away from home, whatever you want to say. But the reality is, one day, this house is going to burn up. It's not going to last. It doesn't really matter. I could live in a smaller house, in a different colored house, in a different location without a pond in the backyard. I don't need this house, though I probably should fix the sump pump occupied till I come. The fact is, this house really doesn't matter, yet I can find my mind thinking about a sump water problem. All right? When I first lived on Airport Road, they lived right by apparently a well, and that thing would run to hear the sump pump working. When it didn't work, I worried. I moved to Cass River. That one had, I believe, four or five sump pumps in that basement. All right? Only one time did that, and I have a problem, and I had to run out Home Depot at uh, about 9.45 at night to fix that. This house, I could hear it from my bedroom. I could hear the sump pump I replaced. This new one's too quiet. Last time I'm going to bed, and I can't hear the sump pump. Now, I'm telling you, useless thoughts, it worried me, though. Because I, I, this is where my mind goes. The basement's filled up with water. All right, when that fills up with water, the furnace is dying, the hot water tank is dying in there, all right, it's going to be a huge mess, I've got to clean it all up, and now my mind is filled, come on, with useless thoughts, useless thoughts. I'm, like I said, this sermon is as much for me as for anybody else. Now, your problem may not be sump pumps, but I wonder if you have a useless thought problem. Fill in whatever you have there, it can be anything. Anything that'll take our minds, like I said before, but I'll say it again, don't allow more thoughts about COVID-19 than the Lord. 
Let me read you two passages that we kind of wind down tonight. How about Psalm chapter 19? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter the speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And the last verse, verse number 14, says this. Let the words of my mouth, and help me if you know it, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. You know what Philippians 4 is saying? The meditation of my heart. And there's a whole lot of power inside that psalm. The strength of God, the strength of His Word, the power, His creation. And he ends it by saying, the psalmist saying, And Lord, help my heart, my meditation, what I rue on, what I dwell on, what I think about, to be acceptable in thy sight. Or how about Psalms 1, 1 through 3? Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, the law, read the law. Read Deuteronomy. In his law, doth he meditate day and night. Read the first five books. Take all five of them. I don't care. Now, I love the Bible. My favorite book is probably in the New Testament. But sometimes I'm reading Leviticus and Deuteronomy, some of those books. Man, they're getting kind of weighty. And yet the psalmist, sweet psalmist of Israel, says, in his law, I meditated day and night. God's word, their strength, there's meditation. And if I do that, we know verse 3, and he shall be like a tree. You wonder why you're not like a tree? You wonder why physically you're tossed all over the place? A double-minded man, James says, is unstable in all his ways. You're tossed like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You're tossed to and fro. Why? Because your mind is not filled, is not based with commendable and profitable God-centered, God-scripture thoughts probably filled with thoughts that are critical or useless. Yeah. Irving S. Olds was chairman, of the chair, was chairman of the U.S. Steel Corporation. He arrived for a stockholders meeting and was confronted by a woman who asked, exactly who do you think you are and what do you do? Without batting an eye, Olds replied, well, I'm your chairman, of course, and you know the duties of a chairman... There's someone who is roughly the equivalent of parsley on a platter of fish. It looks pretty and does nothing. Tonight, my question is if your thoughts in your mind are the fish or the parsley. We can have a lot of parsley in our, in our life. Looks good, takes up some space, but really not worth anything. Useless. Paul challenges us to have, word, to have thoughts that are of good Report. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for your word which brings stability and strength to our lives. Lord, help us tonight. Lord, for me, I, maybe there's someone else, but Lord, I was challenged. I was studying for this message on what fills my mind. Lord, I want to have thoughts that please you. Lord, I don't want to just have a critical mind. Lord, are useless thoughts. Lord, help me have thoughts that are centered on your word. 
I wonder where you're at, whether you're here in the auditorium tonight, whether you're home or somewhere else. God touched your heart. You can bend a knee here, at the front or at home, but bend your heart to the Lord. Let Him touch you. Maybe you need to spend some more time in God's Word and less time on your phone. Let's have thoughts that please the Lord. And maybe you're on the night and maybe you don't know that you have a home in heaven. Maybe you don't know that God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. But he did and he does. The Bible says we're all sinners. But that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. My friend, the Bible says we're all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is separation from God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus paid the price for us, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you and he died for me. He paid the penalty for our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has a gift for you. That gift is life in heaven, eternal life. And by believing in Jesus Christ, you can accept that gift. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wouldn't you call on him today? If you have never trusted Christ today, I'd invite you to trust him with me today. You can pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. And today, wherever you're at, you can believe on Jesus. It's not in a magic in the words you say. It's with the heart that man believeth. But if you've never prayed to trust Christ, would you pray today and trust Christ? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell Him. He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, that He was buried and He rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. My friend... If you just asked Jesus to save you, the Bible says that he did just that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you do me a favor? If you just trusted Christ, would you leave me a message or drop, a, drop me a note? It's a number on your screen. I'm not going to ask you for anything, but I want to give you something. I'd love to send you a free book. So if you did just pray that prayer and you meant that, you never prayed it before. Would you leave me a message on the phone? Would you drop me a line on, the, on our website or send me an email? We love to help you grow as a Christian. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your word which brings clarity and strength to our mind. Lord, may we have a mind and meditation that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen.